Hey there, folks. I'm Matt Hansen. And I'm John Johnson. And you're listening to Planes, Trains, and Comic Books, the podcast where we discuss favorites we've reread, comics we want to read, and everything in between. And here's the comic we picked this week. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Planes, Planes Trains, Trains, and, and Comic, comic Books. books. Uh, <laughs> this week we got a weird, fun one for you guys. Um, it is a book called Transmetropolitan. Uh, which I don't know. Do you never heard of this before, right? I like I I know I've seen the cover and I've seen the main character several times. And you mentioned I was like that sounds familiar. And then yeah, but I other than that I had no I didn't know what the book was about. Okay, yeah, like it's it's one of those things where you you've seen the cover around. Not even you, just like personally. Just I mean, it's around because yeah. it is like a one of those kind of groundbreaking books. There's not really any. I don't even know if it's ground. It's just a weird book. A different book that stands out among its peers and then um and then the main character is so iconic looking that you're like okay yeah i know that guy i know i've seen that face before so um so transmetropolitan i think it's from 1998 Eight. okay and um that was my that was gonna be my guess but <laughs> <laughs> sure. um so it's it's like a <laughs> late 90s book and it's written by warren ellis have you read anything by warren ellis do you I know who that is Okay, not that you know of, but well, I, no, I so I know he's a comic book writer, and he all right because I I know I've I recognize it from probably some movies I've seen that have been made of his works. He's of the vein of like Garth Ennis, who wrote Preacher and that kind of stuff. He's in that he's he's in that field. I don't know if he's Scottish or Irish or English. I'm not sure. All of them are from the British Isles area, um, <laughs> but they're all. He's one of those like we came from Britain along with like Neil Gaiman and Alan Moore and they're kind of the second run um of of people that came from Britain so it was like um Garth Ennis you get Warren Ellis who else I don't know there's like there's just general people that come like Peter Milligan and stuff that they they came over after like Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman kind of led the way Grant Morrison kind of in there too but he was a little earlier than them so um so yeah like he his style is very just like like all of his books are kind of like fuck you <laughs> like a lot of them are like that some, some of them are really well written like uh, they don't have characters like this but uh for the most part he's g- generally like a very cynical like writer um and a lot of his characters kind of hold those kind of views uh but yeah so it's warren ellis did the writing and then Derek robertson did the artwork had you read anything with Derek Robertson's art before? Not that I, I not that I would know. And I mean, it, it, like you said, the we were kind of talking about this beforehand. That it's a very nineties artwork. Um, yeah, like all well, like the designs, the designs yeah. at least. Yeah, like and it's really it was really nice and really pretty. Um, but yeah, like some especially some of the the character designs, at least background ones for sure. Yeah, very very nineties. Yeah, like just their hairstyles and yeah. dress and all that. But even their dress because it's this is set in the future, so. <laughs> The nineties, what the what the, what we thought in the future, the ninety, what in the nineties we thought the future would be, I should say. Yeah, and uh, so you know, people have uh, word processors still. They're writing, they're writing. It's before laptops got popular, and they're writing with word processors still. And somehow it's you know, people are still reading the news regularly. Yeah, <laughs> gotta read and, the read those columns. Yeah, so um. So it's a we it's a funny future to look at from a '90s point of view, and look back on the '90s and laugh at them and how they didn't know what they were talking about. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, the, this book is about a journalist, and it's about a journalist fighting, um, n- not even this specific book, but just overarching, the journalist is fighting the power of the government, and, um, over, over the whole kind of series that's the theme like he just it's about him fighting any kind of power generally or him at least taking the piss out of power um like laughing at it and if and if there isn't if there's something bigger than that like if there's uh if it's a government he'll fight him and try to take him down if it's like some asshole he'll just like punch him or whatever you know so um he just hates authority in general i think <laughs> i think is the the theme of this book so um <laughs> What do you think of the opening of this book? It starts off very weird. Very, very weird. Some hairy man living up in the mountains. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it starts on, there's a, it just, you know, shows a, a cabin in the woods and there's a, a man and he's all hairy and everything. He looks a lot like Alan Moore, which I thought was funny. He's got a big bushy beard and a big, you know, all long hair, just covered in hair basically. Yeah. Uh, is, is the place he's living and hasn't had much of a um, cleaning or anything like that. And it says he's been up there for five years. And uh, he gets a phone call randomly, which I'm surprised he, he even has service. He has, I'm surprised he had a phone. I figured he... Well, they, everybody has a regular, you know, line landline phone, too, yeah. on this. So that's funny. But yeah, he gets called and he's like, what the hell? I thought I disconnected this thing or whatever. And then, uh, and then it turns out he's got uh, a publisher, I guess, that he signed a deal with. Uh, we're like, hey, we're going to sue you. Where's our fucking books? You've been up there for a long time. You haven't been working on them books? Yeah, like you owe us two books. What the fuck? And uh, so so basically he's like, I don't I've been up here for five years. I don't I didn't remember that I had your books. They're like, we gave you the money. <laughs> it's like that's how he stayed up there for five years. Was He just took their money and didn't write books and just stayed up there for five years. So they're like, well, we're going to sue you. And I guess in the future, maybe that means something worse. Some, yeah. So he's like kind of, oh, shit, I should go back and finish those books. And it kind of gives you a little insight into him because they said you've got two books, one political and then one whatever you want to write about. And you're right. Like, oh, okay, so he's he's a writer. He he's he's a commentator on things. So. Right. And and for those of you who've read uh, anything by Hunter S. Thompson or know who that is as a you know iconic figure of American history, uh, <laughs> he is very much basically that guy. Like he is basically Hunter S. Thompson. Um, this character. He looks a lot like him. Very similar. Uh, he's got, I don't know, he's got the same personality generally. And he writes very similar too. So um, he did a good job, I thought, of mimicking the style of, like the free form thought of consciousness writing or whatever that, that Hunter S. Thompson would do sometimes um, in his books. And so, yeah, it, it was good. But anyway, back to the story, he like, so he he's, like, I have to write these stupid books, which means I have to go back to the city, which means I have to go get a job. And, the, and it's weird because this book kind of has different tones. And, like, sometimes it's super serious and you're like, well, that's fucked up. And he's like, yeah, this is fucked up. Everybody should, you know, think this is fucked up. And I'm going to write about it. And then sometimes he pulls a rocket launcher out of yeah. his pocket and blows up a bar. That, I was going to say, that was, like, the the... The weirdest thing, just starting it, and that's kind of what got me hooked, is like, okay, he's this weird guy. He's kind of like been living in solitude, obviously, and he's crazy a little bit because uh, you know his appearance and what he, how he was talking about things. And he's like, okay, I'm gonna go back. And then he's coming down the mountain. And he's like, look at this bar. You know, I've I've spent time there, and I fucking hate everybody there. And then yeah. pulls out a rocket launcher. <laughs> yeah, he just pulls out a rocket launcher and just shoots him. So. And yeah, destroys it. I was like, oh, all right then. Yeah. <laughs> like, where's this going? <laughs> yeah, it's weird, and and. That's where you kind of get like, okay, it's is this a silly book? Is it a serious book? And it very much is a serious book. But then I think, you know, trying to bring a little levity into it, it's, uh, uh, you know, he does these little silly moments to just kind of, you know, not make it so dark or whatever. And it lets you kind of like like the character a little bit more, you know, you get to know his personality. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and well, I was just thinking of the person that drew the book, Derek Robertson. He did the boys. That's his big thing oh, okay. that he did the art in. So, um, for all of you who might have watched the boys on Amazon, Amazon? yeah, um, he did the original art for that comic, which is written by Garth Ennis, Warren Ellis's, you know, <laughs> kind of co part. They're not partners, but they're you know, co British persons writing. So, <laughs> um, very, they're both very cynical, very similar as far as the way they write. I think at least I'm they probably would be like, fuck you if, I, if they heard me say that. But they'd probably be like, fuck you anyway, because they're like that. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So so like I said, we get some weird tones in this, but it's kind of just the color, the character a little bit. And and also be like, this is a comic book, guys. Also, you know, we're, we're, we were talking about serious stuff that you should think about, but also don't think too hard. Um, and so, like, basically, he, he starts going back to the city um and he's like i need a job first because i need to be able I, I need to have insurance he says that a lot he's like i need to have writer's insurance i need, yeah, I need, I need, to, yeah, I need this insurance right away yeah and like if i have a job at like a journalist 
or a, at a journal or a newspaper, um, they'll be able to put me up in an apartment and stuff, and then I'll have money to live, and then I can find stories to write books on and stuff. So, um, so he goes right away. Uh, he, it's funny. He like drives into the city, and then you see like he goes to he hits a toll booth to get into the city, and the guy has like like cybernetics kind of in his head or whatever like he's listening to radio or some shit yeah but plugged into his head yeah like into his neck like yeah. matrix style and then um and then he gets into the city and then there's just a traffic jam and yeah. so he just gets out of the car and starts walking <laughs> he's like ah fuck this car and he's walking across like the tops of cars yeah like not even like it like the traffic is so tight there's no space in between the cars so he just walks on top of all the cars and then you see this is where you see like he walks through the city you get a kind of um a glimpse at what the city's like it's super diverse and by diverse i mean there's every race every culture every um type of person there's like alien half people and um there's like you know women walking around half naked yeah. and then there's also police all over the place and they're kind of like talking to people that shouldn't be around and stuff and and it was the and again the very 90s esque as far as the dress and whatnot. and then even the aliens to me they're like X Files, like yes. what you think aliens in the '90s, like little green or gray men with the big uh, oval kind of eyes, yeah. um, you know, kind of like a thin flat. body, thin face. Exactly. So that was cool. You know, it was yeah. It fit. It fit the tone of, of everything. Yeah, very much X Files ish as far as aliens go. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So then we see he goes. Uh, he goes to uh, this place called the Word, which I guess is like the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I, I got to talk to Royce. I know Royce there. Um, and you know what? This He also reminds if you kind of, in your head, what his voice would sound like, a little bit like Rick from Rick and Morty. <laughs> he's got that manic feel he about does. the way Every he talks. Time we, yes. <laughs> and I think maybe Rick was like the, his, the way that he talks and stuff might have been based on. Hunter S. Thompson? Because Hunter S. Thompson or maybe even or this character Rick, a little yeah. bit because Dan Harmon, I'm sure, reads comics. And oh, stuff. yeah. So. Like, I could just see him reading this and being like, I want a cynical character like that to be Rick or whatever, you know? So, but for whatever, regardless. Um, uh, yeah, so he goes to, to go to the Word to talk to this guy named Royce. And he's like, you owe me a job, Royce. <laughs> you know, you want me to uh, write some good stories for you? He's like, where have you been? It's been five years. Like, you, you, know, you came out of nowhere. Um, and then you see so you get, like, their kind of working relationship and whatnot. And Royce knows... He's an asshole, but he's going to do good work. You know, I'm going to be able to sell his work. And the the, the idea of selling uh, good work in journalism nowadays is funny, too. So Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he says, like, he makes $10,000 or whatever, or, like, thousands of dollars off of his articles and stuff later on. I'm like, what the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> he was so wrong about the future of journalism. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so he gives him a job, and he puts him up in, like, a shitty place. And this is, uh, like, we got a little bit of it, but this is where we find his full name, it's Spider Oh yeah, Jerusalem. That's right, we forgot they, about that. Because they, they called him and they said Jerusalem, and that's all we got. And I didn't know if it was a code name or something at first, or uh, a, 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 sur- what was it a surname? A pseudonym. A pseudonym for yeah, when he was writing. But yeah, but then he gets there and they're like, Spy- Spider Jerusalem, you son of a bitch. Which is a fantastic <laughs> fucking name. It's like... Um, anybody who's read Snow Crash is like Vitaly Chernobyl or <laughs> one of those weird high, hard sci-fi book names. It's fantastic. I love Spider Jerusalem. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, Neil Stevenson should have written this book. <laughs> that is that is one of the best uh, comic book names I've ever, ever yeah. seen. <laughs> yeah, and and then uh, so so yeah, he gets put up in an apartment and it's like a really shitty apartment. And it, one of the things I like about this is uh, he's got uh, this machine. That's in his apartment that can make anything. You know, like you just say, hey, "I want a new suit," and it makes suit for you, and it does your measurements and shit itself. And he he like so he you know at first he like goes into a shower and he's like set flames on full or whatever, and it like just burns all the hair off of him. And then he comes out and he's like perfectly clean, yeah, per- like perfectly smooth, yeah, to toe, bald, everything, yeah. yeah. And so being got, the hairy man. Yeah, no hair at all. He's got all these tattoos, kind of like tribal tattoos, so 90s style. And then <laughs> and then um, he's got, uh, so he goes to get a suit from this machine in his apartment. And the machine gives him a suit, but also 
gives him these weird glasses because he wants like um he says oh i need like glasses that take photographs and video so it's kind of like google glass ish and um and then when they come out they're like one one's uh, one side of the lenses is, is uh red and it's circular and the other side is a rectangle and it's green and he's like what the fuck <laughs> and he's like and he looks behind the machine and the machine's got like a a drug you know fused into its back and he's like you're on the st- you're on the stuff you can't take the psychedelic <laughs> shit when you're making stuff for me and it's like the machine itself is is conscious which is weird it like wants to take drugs it's so odd i don't know <laughs> It's just weird shit like that, that like, you know, I don't know. In this future world, the machines are, are sentient, but they also do what we say. It's not like Terminator. And, yeah. and but they like want to do drugs to like help pass time and make stuff fun or whatever. And I don't know. It's weird shit like that. That's what we should say, too. When we saw all the people as he was walking through the city, again, lots of 90s-esque clothes and, and hairstyles and whatnot. But a lot of the people have those like cybernetic kind of things. Like there's some oh, yeah. that have like goggly things. Like things that like look like headphones, but that were like attached to their head. Yeah, like infused into their skull or whatever. Yeah, it was really cool. It was very like Matrix, kind cyberpunk, of punk, cyberpunk. Yeah, kinda, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, the the aesthetic for this book is really it's well very, done. Yeah. And I, I don't. I wish. Uh, I mean, I don't know how much uh, Warren Ellis was part of that. I mean, I'm sure he was like, "This is what I'm thinking of," and then Derek Robertson had to imagine all of it and write and draw <laughs> that shit. So this is probably a really fun book to draw just because there's so many different, you know, things going on. Um, so then uh, so he, he does that and then he sees on the TV, which I thought this was great. He's like, TV, see, like put 125,000 channels on all at once. but They scroll through like every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds it switches to a different channel and he's got like 10 TVs all doing this. So he gets all the news all at once and. He can see what's going on, and then, like, when he hears something interesting, he'll be like, pause. You know, I want to know what's going on with that. And as he's talking to the TV, he sees this guy come on, and it's uh, Fred Fred Christ? Fred that? Christ. Fred Christ, who is, uh, from what looks like, split down the middle of his body is half alien, half human. Half it, half David Bowie human, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, <laughs> he he like, looks very David Bowie. He yes. he, well, he had, like, the JTT hair. Yeah. Like, you know, and... Uh, so 90s, you know, hair and but he had like just split down the middle is weird. Like half of his body is an alien or at least half of his face. And then the other half is a human. And then uh, he's, he's saying like um, we are all us transients are uh, tired of this of living like, you know, third class citizens. And we are going to secede from this city. We're taking District Angels 8, which is where they all are. And we're like seceding from the union basically or whatever um and that's like where the first issue ends and you're like what the fuck like, what the fuck just yeah. happened yeah and it's like it's just weird because you you know it's just it's such a crazy idea but spider is like oh fred you know like he knows right away oh that's he knows fred and he's gonna write an article about this you know what's going on and um so the second issue starts he's going to like um he's trying he's gonna like go see fred and uh, go to like Angel Eight, Angels Eight, which is the district that all the transients live. And transients is like trans human and alien. Like they're basically the humans are like I don't want to be a human anymore, or I don't feel like I'm human. And so they, there was a a, a group of aliens that uh, like rented out, I guess, or leased their uh, genetic uh material to be able to f- like make people turn into those that style of alien so when we say all the aliens are like that we're talking about these specific aliens are like the x-files aliens yeah the rest of them might be different in the rest of the book but um in this specific one these specific aliens that people are transitioning into are you know and it, this is an interesting thought because um trans you know, it's even called transy. It's, it's an interesting th- thing because trans rights and everything right now. It's super prevalent. Yeah, it's, and it's it's relevant. Yeah. Is that what you meant? Yeah. <laughs> That's it. I'm sorry. Super relevant. It's super relevant right wow. now. And, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so, so like, it's interesting that a book 20 years earlier is, you know, we've caught up to it kind of. Even though it missed some stuff, it got other things. 
uh, correct or whatnot. You know, at least as an allusion to, you know, kind of like the X-Men and, you know, was like an allusion to minority rights or gay rights or, you know, rights for people of color. Um, a lot of people could read into that later on and be like, oh, that they're, the X-Men are talking about me, um, even though they're, you know, Stanley's writing about mutants or whatever. So, so this was kind of like that where it's trans rights, but it's transient as an alien rights. So, um, so we get, he goes over there and right away, like they, they've blocked off, they've barricaded the streets. So, uh, people can't get in and it's like, shitty block like it's like four feet high yeah just like crushed and cars and yeah and there's one guy standing there and he's like can't come in he's like get the fuck out of the way and he like burns the dude in the eye with a cigarette oh, with his cigarette <laughs> yeah and that's where you see like does he care about these fucking people or not like like up to up until this point you don't know if he does you don't know that part of his personality but later on you see he's supposed to like you know he he writes an article about how you know how horrible what's happening to them is but then he doesn't have a problem like burning a guy in the eye or kicking some people in the balls or whatever. And it's just because I think what what this guy hates more than anything is people in authority. <laughs> Regardless of people who think they're in authority, too, and especially if they aren't, um, you know, he'll just kick them or punch them or whatever out of the way. Um, and then the people who actually are in authority, he really hates those people like the president or the government or whatever. Yeah. So, um. So he goes, he, you know, burns that guy in the eye and while that guy's, you know, freaking out, he like jumps over the barricade. He's walking, he's seeing all, it's basically like a slum where like these people are all here. There's no, um, anything for them. There's no like housing specifically that they're allowed to, or, you know, able to be in, um, just people walking around homeless. There was a lady he talked to that she had like a baby and he's like, Oh my God, like what's going on with you? And. She's like, it's like, Fred Crest's baby. Yeah, she's like, it's Fred's baby. And he's like, because he was like, oh, do you know where Fred is? Can I talk to Fred? And he's like, you know, you shouldn't have that baby out here or whatever. Because he knows they're about to get, like, fucked up by the police. Because in his mind, he's like, um, he's, he says, it's a re-election year with a president who's like, he calls him the beast, which is fun. He calls the president the beast. And the president is... Like a law and order president. So there's no way that the president's going to like stand for this yeah, people, secession. Yeah. You know, so he's like, all these people are about to die and they don't know it. So I got to go talk to Fred Christ. So that's why he's here. And on top of it being like a story anyway. And then, um, so he's talking to her and he's like, where's Fred? And she's like, he's that way. And tell him this is his baby while you're at it. So right away you kind of get like, Fred's kind of a shitty person. <laughs> and then, um, he walks up and she points to the bar and the bar is called Bazoom. Bazoom. <laughs> and it's just, so it's a strip bar and that's where his headquarters is. So you're like right away you're like this guy's a fucking dirtbag. <laughs> and uh he walks up and I mean the the uniform these are some uniform transient people and they're the uniforms are in a very Nazi-ish. Yeah. <laughs> the specifically their red bands on their arms with their symbol and the symbol well, not a swastika, but it again very symbolizes it's a happy face, like the standard yellow with the happy face, but it's got three eyes. Yeah, and he just like kicks him in the nuts. He says like they had a gun. Like it even, I read this like three times and said, you know, uh, you know, trying to pull a gun on me, and they didn't have a gun. He kicks him in the nuts, and then magically, the next couple panels, he pulls out a gun. <laughs> so like. I think he was just saying that to, like, you know, either make other people think that it was okay that he was that beating, he was him, beating up. him up. Yeah. And then he pulls out a gun and is like, where's Fred? I want to talk to Fred. And this is, like, where the cartooniness also comes in because, it once again, it's serious. But then he starts shooting randomly and people are, you know, it's, like, cartoony kind of. Um, and people are, aren't, like, freaking out that much about it. And they're like, Fred's over there. And then Fred comes out and he's like, what's going on? And he's got, like... A towel yeah. on or whatever, or bed don't, sheet. Don't you know I need undisturbed sex every six hours and things? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's basically what it is. And he, and so we see like Spider right away is like, ah, oh, Fred, you fucker! Like I knew this was bullshit. So then he gets an interview with Fred, and Fred, I guess Fred knew him from back in the day, uh, before he was uh, transient. And so he's talking to him, and Fred thinks Fred's naive. Fred thinks 
uh, the government isn't going to attack them. They're just going to, like, yeah, they might quell it, but they want to negotiate or something for, for more trans rights. And uh, Spider's like, are you fucking serious? Like, you think that's what's going to happen? All they need is to, like, cause, um, like, a, an incident to happen that like gives that gives police a reason to come in here and you're all dead like and that and that doesn't have to be actually something you guys do they can make something happen and then they have cover a cover story for them coming in and killing all of you and fred's like i don't i don't know about that and he gives him like you know a little a little uh interview about kind of like where what he thinks about what fred thinks about you know stuff going on um and then that's pretty much it for the interview. But then he also sees, like, there's all these ladies. He's just, Fred's there to fuck ladies. And Fred gets mad at him because he calls it out. He's like, hey, like, you know, Spider's like, hey, Fred, you know, you you just want to fuck people and get famous. Like, you don't actually care about. Well, and Fred tries to cover, too, because I like what he said. He was like, it's different when you're transitioning to the alien because, like, you like your you have different desires that you have. You do, can't eat like human food as much anymore. And oh yeah, like, he's going in through through all the different things. Basically, trying to give an excuse for him for being a, d- a piece of shit. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, Spider's not buying any of it. He's oh, like, yeah. maybe that's true, but you're still you know an asshole. And like, you got a kid down the block, and you got all these other ladies that are, you're fucking all the time. Um, you know, you don't really care about what happens to these people. And so then he leaves. And as he's leaving, he sees a guy in a suit. So he's like, fucking lawyers. You can always smell them from, like, you know, miles away. And they're talking to someone on a corner. So you don't know what that's for, like, the reason for, but that's pretty much how that issue ends. Is like, he comes back. He's like, I know. Oh. Except, one only other thing is he gets his cat. He's, oh, yeah. He's walking through the streets, and there's this, like, three-eyed, I, I guess, transient cat. And he's like, hey, you... uh you need some help, and then the cat like just needs a cigarette. And well, it's it's not even like a three eyed cat; it's like a two faced cat. It's a like a cat yeah. with two uh, with a f- second face growing out of his face. So it's like a weird alien cat. And then later on, the cat's like smoking, yeah, and like knows what people are saying because he'll be like, Spider would be like, "Hey, can you like where did I put my keys?" And the cat's like, and "Like he's like, oh thanks. thanks, like you know." <laughs> so the cat is somewhat you know conscious, yeah, because I think at one point he's like. He will tell somebody like get cigarettes. I smoke these, and my cat smokes these. <laughs> so th- that's pretty much where that that ends. Um, he I think he tells his boss like, hey, no race calls him because that's the that's the reoccurring. Oh, thing. that's right. Yeah. He keeps forgetting to like finish things and what. So they're like forgetting Ray, in yeah, quotation marks. To, yeah. So Race is like, hey, where the hell is that column? It's like I need it in like I don't know, eight, like what's well, like eight hours. Well, and something. that's the thing. He's like he gave him a time limit for everything. He's like. You have, you know, I'm giving you an apartment and all this stuff. Uh, you have like 48 hours to give me like a 10,000 word article or whatever. So, uh, he, yeah, Royce called him and said, I need, you know, this. And he, you know, he's like, I got a, you know, a thing with Fred Christ, an interview with Fred Christ. He's like, who gives a shit? That guy gives interviews to everybody. He's like, meh, we'll see if this one had some better, you know, different stuff in it. Um, and then he sees on the TV, like, Oh no, firebombs, you know, the the transients caused a firebombing. They threw firebombs at police or something. So right there and then the issue ends right there. So, you know, Spider knows, "Oh fuck," and he like runs out of his house. And so um we see like basically that lawyer that was there before was like paying one of the transients, I guess, to either throw the bomb or set the bomb down, and then now the police have a reason to go crack skulls. And so uh, part three starts, or issue three, and basically the police are just stomping all the fucking transients. Beating the crap out of them. Yeah, I mean, the transients don't really have weapons other than fists or, you know, bars and stuff. The police come off as a little Judge Dredd-ish to you, like their outfits? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think there's a reason (laughs) for that. Um, But yeah, I mean... it, it's weird because, I mean, British people like Judge Dredd, right? But yeah. also, Judge Dredd is super, po- I mean, he's like a cop, yeah. right? So, and he's like, I am the law I and a judge and an executioner, right? So, it's kind of like, you don't want that law, right? That's what we don't want in the future. Yeah. <laughs> but people like him. So, they definitely look like that. Um, 
and they're just stomping on people's heads. I mean, this this is pretty bloody. This is definitely bloody. a mature audience uh, mm-hmm. comic, and so you know they're splitting people up, and uh, he's able to run. Spider's able to run past all this stuff and runs back into Bazooms, and uh, he gets in there and he goes to the roof with a couple strippers, and they're all watching it from the roof, and he's like. Uh, hey Royce I'm on the roof I'm inside this riot like I'm gonna send you like my thread of consciousness article right now live live (laughs) I'm gonna like and he's got his little fucking fat word processor that apparently can go on the internet or bluetooth or something and they bluetooth straight to Royce and so then Royce is like we're not gonna have time to edit he's like doesn't matter we're going we're doing this this is it it's live do you want it or not and Royce is like yes so Royce actually takes it behind Spider's back and Spider doesn't know this and he sells two hours of like airtime to another network that's just streaming his like written words article that's you know a stream of consciousness article that's going on right now. So Spider doesn't know, but everything he's typing is on like Times Square or it's Century Square, that's what it's called. But it's like on all the screens there and everybody's house and every you know. So everybody's seeing what he's talking about, and he's just typing. I mean, it's basically like, like I said, reading Hunter S. Thompson novel about uh, the police brutalizing, you know, these uh, transient people um, under the pretense of they started this riot by firebombing someone. Um, and and you see, like, basically, Spider just starts. He, he's such a good writer that he gets everybody on his side that's reading this article they're like oh my god the police are doing that to these people and um and there's no photos or anything no it's just but I can see, it was just words. from what i saw it was just words on this now his glasses do take photos so he did have photos of this stuff going on but for the most part but i it, think it was just yeah, the writing yeah everything else everybody was looking at was only the words right so he's definitely like uh, a really good writer <laughs> Because people, he convinces people all this is happening in real time right now, and the government can't do anything about it, which I thought was funny, too. I'm like, if the government was that hardcore, <laughs> they could just shut that shit down. Like, there's no such thing as a constitution in, in a riot or whatever, you know? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so he gets, uh, or he's doing all that, and all of a sudden the cops, like, stop. And they just start pulling back, and the strippers are like, hey, Spider, he's pulled back. Or they're, they're leaving, he's like, what the fuck? No, they're not. Like, there's no way that could happen. And then uh, he looks. He's like, holy shit. And then he gets a call from Royce. And Royce is like, oh, my God, Spider. Like, <laughs> it's amazing. Like, this is happening. Like, you got the police to stop. And Spider's like, what? Like, what? How, how did that happen? And Royce is like, oh, I sold, like, <laughs> I sold, I sold you two hours. <laughs> I sold this network two hours of everything you, you wrote. And so now you're famous again. And he's like, fuck. I didn't want to be famous. And, he's like, and now you're rich. There's a bunch of money. And then all of a sudden you see Spider, who was all angry about being famous and having all this stuff happen to him. And he's like, money? How much money? How much like, money are we talking? <laughs> <laughs> and he gets this big fucking smile on his face. I, lo- I love the like way he draws that grin. And, um, and then so he's like walking back uh, after all this and uh, to back to his apartment. And he's like, ah, you know, maybe this is going to be okay or whatever. And then all of a sudden, the cops pull up and beat the ever-living shit out of him. Yeah. And they're like, don't fuck, you know, if you ever, you know, get involved with a police matter again, you're fucking dead. And then he, like, I think he got, like, pictures of them and stuff with his glasses and everything. And then um, and then they leave, and he's, like, happier than ever. He's like... <laughs> Yeah, like basically to him, this means that he's getting under their skin and he's going to continue and it's going to be awesome. And he's like ready to fucking take down the beast and the cops and the political machine. So, um, yeah, and that's how this this whole thing ends. It's a really good like cliffhanger. It really makes you want to read the yeah. rest of that story. Now, oh, they uh, they before he left, they they, were, they announced that they had found Fred's body. Uh, I guess they they killed Fred in the. Oh yeah, and he had like a thirteen year old girl. Thirteen year old got- girl, yeah. And I like what Spider said. He said like, "Oh, I've got a good name for this story. Is it uh, Fred Christ, Alien Love Messiah, or Sad Piece of Shit?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, he had, he had a lot of great one liners. Yes, in this. this this series is commentator. all about one liners and all about like the magnanimous personality that is you know Spider Jerusalem. Um, 
And that glorious name. It's a fantastic name. <laughs> so, uh, and I, the the image that you would have seen if you walked through a comic book store would have been Spider Jerusalem with his shit eating grin on his face and his glasses of the red and green circle and rectangle, um, and he's smiling up at you. And that that's like in his little suit and everything. That's what you you'd see. You know it if you saw it. Um, so yeah, that's that's this issue. Um, what would you give this one, John? It was fun, and uh, like you said, it hooked me pretty quick. Uh, being like, oh wow, okay, yeah, where is this going? And yeah, I want to read more. There's a little more in the the collection that we had, but they were like one shots. But I did go ahead and just yeah. like kind of go through them, and it was they were fun. They we were kind of talking. They they felt like kind of weird individual like Rick and Morty episodes, but his personality is, it's fun. I read a lot of, um, we'll call them blasphemous comics back, uh, (laughs) when I, when I first started, uh, reading comics, uh, like my, my mom got me like Spider-Man and Batman and stuff. And then, um, as I started branching out, I became friends with you and you were, you were in, you know, you were working at a comic book store. We started, you started showing me all these weird stuff and I found Battle Pope and Loaded Bible and stuff. Yeah. It just, it's fun to see like, Story like I, you know, I grew up pretty fairly in a religious family, so seeing like stories like that and then extrapolating them to like just ridiculous levels, yeah, is hysterical for me. And then this one is like this guy who's like a journalist and like he doesn't like religious leaders, anybody in power, political leaders, and just kind of taking them all down and like exposing like the truth of it all. It, I loved it. I thought it was really fun. Yeah, and this like and this storyline really. Like just or the whole series, I think it's like sixty six issues or something long, um, and through the through the story arc in between, you know, the one shots and stuff that happened, like it's all about him tearing down the political machine and, um, you know, taking on different presidential candidates and stuff. So it's really kind of timely if you think about it. <laughs> like it's a very timely book right now, specifically, um, with all the stuff going on in politics and journalism yep. and everything right now um sociological and everything too so um yeah so what would you give so it going back i would say i would give this one an eight it was a lot of an fun eight. yeah i would 100 percent keep reading it reread it it was great definitely like you said mature audience so would you know make sure no, no yeah. kiddos pick up the book but it's it's a good one yeah it's good for like a teenager like yeah. i'd give it to a 15 year old kid or something or 16 to be like you you know you hate authority right like <laughs> you're a teenager here's like a <laughs> fucked up fun book to read you know that's like the perfect age for all that shit and it's it's idealistic too because it's like this is what a journalist should be kind of thing like someone who's hard-hitting and uh is looking for the truth the not truth. the most salacious story but they know how to write to make it a salacious story or whatever but it, there's the there's the truth that's going on behind it um and that's what is his moral center is always i'm exposing authority to truth kind of thing like uh, I'm ex- I'm exposing all these fucking fakes and phonies and hacks and murderers and you know all that and like warmongers. I'm exposing them with my amazing ability of the pen is mightier than the sword kind of thing, you know. So, um, yeah, I would give this one, I would give this one a seven, mainly because while it's I don't know, like it it's good. And I liked it a lot. I just feel like I don't know if it's groundbreaking. Yeah, or anything. I was like, you know, we, we've had this discussion. Matt's scale is the groundbreaking scale, and John's is yeah. Like, was it fun? <laughs> yeah, because if I read this in, in 1998, I'd be like, that was a fun book. I want to keep reading it, but not like this changed my fucking viewpoint of the world or something, you know. So that's how. Yeah, Matt's groundbreaking scale, and John's it's fun scale. So. <laughs> So and both are great. I mean, both are perfect reasons to read a comic book, and I like fun books too. So I mean, don't get me wrong. I read the shit out of you know weird adventure stories and stuff just for funsies. So, um, so anyway, on that note, I think we're done. And if you guys got any comments, questions, or suggestions, please email us at planes, trains, and comic books, all one word, at gmail dot com. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. We've got our twitter our youtube channel going up now uh, pretty strong we've got our instagram as well so yeah hit us up on there let us know what you think see ya bye well folks hope you enjoyed that episode if you did and you'd like to follow us on social media our facebook is planes trains and comic books and our instagram is at planes trains and comic books all one word 
And be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more recommendations to add to your weekly pull list. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.